Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Selecting the Right Storage Architecture for Enterprise Data Center's Fiber Channel versus Hyperconverged. All lines will be placed on mute. During the webinar, if you have a question, feel free to type your question into the system, and we will follow up directly with you after the webinar. This webinar will be recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording by the end of the week. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to Michelle Lemieux-Demas, Product Marketing Manager at Brocade. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Michelle Lemieux-Demas from Brocade, and I'm joined today with storage technology experts and industry veterans. AJ Casamento, a solutioner from Brocade, and Praveen Mida, a product marketing manager from Cavium. We will be discussing the overall storage landscape, provide insight into how to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses that different architectures present, and discuss how selecting the right storage architecture is critical in order to thrive in today's business. So Praveen and AJ, Enterprise data centers today are faced with how they modernize their infrastructure to keep up with today's demands. Can you walk us through today's data center landscape? Well, Michelle, the pressures of IT organizations continue to climb due to increased expectations of feature-rich applications, right? So the, the uncompromising SLAs, skyrocketing volumes of data, these are all putting pressure into the system. At the same time, the good news for, <clears throat> for IT is that the rate of change in IT is higher than it ever has been before. Of course, the downside of the bad news is that the rate of change in IT is higher than it ever has been before, and the gaps between the technology cycles have shortened, and arguably infrastructure now needs to be able to handle multiple technology stages at the same time. Wouldn't you agree, Praveen? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, AJ. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, CIOs today face pressure on multiple fronts, including cutting costs, uh, becoming more customer-focused, and being more responsive to evolving business needs. Um, to answer some of these difficult challenges, IT departments are evaluating their journey to the cloud. Uh, they, choose, they have to choose between a private only, a public only, or a hybrid cloud, and then decide what apps and data should stay on-prem, what can migrate to the cloud, and apps that are cloud native and can be deployed in the cloud seamlessly. Some of the key decision points are really around ROI, data reliability, availability, security, regulatory requirements, as well as agility and scale. Wow, those are some uh, great challenges that customers are faced with. Um, so, Praveen, can you describe what trends are driving this modernization? Sure. So, uh, I think uh, there are multiple trends that are driving this uh, uh, modernization. Um, IT has been evolving from a hardware-defined data center uh, to a software-defined data center. And with software-defined data center, IT can provision various resources around compute, networking, and storage faster, more flexibly, and, res and response to meeting SLA requirements for those given workloads. Besides software-defined data center, there are some exciting new storage technology vectors around huge improvements in performance with Flash, NVMe, 3D crosspoint that are actually enabling new uh, use cases around disaggregated storage and NVMe or fabrics as well as in-memory compute with storage class memory. You know, over the last 30 years, we've been moving bottlenecks around in data centers, right? First, it was CPU performance was the constraint, then it was the scale of memory, and then the storage capacity in the, in the disk drives, and then network performance, and then back around, right? With this set of drivers, the pressure is coming back around to the infrastructure to meet these demands, and that includes the capability of automation to support configuration of that software-defined data center. So, AJ, though, can you tell us about what emerging technologies are coming into the data center then? Sure. So, as, as an example, some of the bottlenecks that are moving um, as, as flash storage comes in are, are seen <clears throat> back in that infrastructure. The concepts of converged, hyper-converged, and software-defined infrastructures are, are coming, into, coming into play uh, as a discussion with IT. So, Praveen, maybe you can give us some thoughts around the details for that. Absolutely. I'll be happy to. So, some of the key trends around storage in the data center include, um, you know, emergence and rapid adoption of flash. As flash latencies continue to drop and performance continues to climb, proprietary interfaces as well as standard interfaces like SAS and SATA just couldn't keep up. 
And that led to the creation of a whole new block storage protocol called NVMe, which is NVMe or NVM over PCIe bus. Now, Flash requires a fast, reliable storage protocol, and that explains why over 80% of all Flash arrays today are attached to fiber channel. And rather than limit NVMe Flash captive to a server, NVMe over fabrics or NVMe OF allows, it's a new standard that allows sharing of NVMe all Flash arrays across multiple hosts. The other big trend that uh, we are noticing uh, that's picking up now is storage disaggregation. So with Flash getting more affordable, traditional JBODs are migrating to JBOFs, and with the NVMe or Fabric standards getting adopted, these JBOFs are now migrating to what is called FBOFs, or Fabric-enabled, Fabric-ready uh, bunch of Flash. So they have Fabric connectivity going in. This trend of JBOFs migrating to FBOFs is fueling a key trend in the data center around storage disaggregation, so hosts and storage can connect via Fabric switches and grow and scale independently. And uh, the third and my last uh, trend I want to talk about is really around software-defined storage. So as it is commonly being said, software is eating the world. Data centers are adopting SDS so they can use commodity hardware to build out, scale out storage solutions with a software layer abstraction, uh, provisioning, automation, availability, management, and HEI builds on these SDS concepts to integrate virtualized workloads via hypervisor or containers. So, but Praveen, um, what workloads are the sweet spot for HCI versus fiber channel SANs? How do you decide what goes where? So, Michelle, I think that's an important point. Um, we talked about HCI, we talked about fiber channel, so what goes where? So some typical use cases for HEI include test and development, uh, virtual desktop infrastructure or VDI, server consolidation, disaster recovery, and remote office, branch office infrastructure. Some typical use cases for fiber channel, and by the way, fiber channel has been around for about 20 plus years, include OLTP or online transaction processing, data warehousing and mining, backup restore, and server virtualization. Companies that are looking to deploy a mission-critical application like banks, airlines, insurance companies almost entirely rely on fiber channel. However, for non-mission-critical applications like test and development, VDI, or uh, Robo, customers are standing up HCIS clusters of four to eight servers. The survey mentions that 78% of respondents have deployed less than eight HCI or SDS nodes in their company overall. You know, Michelle, you can find examples of almost any type of workload in different environments. People will put different workloads in, in, uh, in various places. But some of the more prevalent ones in, are, are, or some are more prevalent in one environment rather than another. I would argue that HCI does very well in environments where the number of IT staff are severely constrained or the environments are small, and fiber channel will tend to be more used in environments that require performance, deterministic delivery, transactional applications, and data protection services all at scale. That makes sense, AJ. So what critical capabilities should administrators consider when looking at their next technology implementation? Well, there's a pretty significant list of them, but it, you know, you sort of keep in mind that the original purpose of shared storage environments was heavily driven by the concept that no single disk drive is infinitely large, infinitely performant, or infinitely reliable. In data centers, the need for scalability is paramount. Huge volumes of data continue to aggregate across far more microservices applications than we've dealt with before. The, you know, the old monolithic applications are, are, are fading. But while scale needs to be on demand at an application level, one also needs availability. Right? There is no forgiveness for application outages. Um, basically, your, your brand uh, loyalty is only as good as your last performance. Right? Similarly, customers are unforgiving about the loss or theft of data. The recent Equifax breach is a fair example of that. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, let me also hit on a few of these uh, critical capabilities. So let me just first uh, baseline this discussion by reinforcing that FC is a low latency, lossless, hardware offloaded, zero copy, highly scalable, and highly deterministic storage transport. With all the innovation around store fusion that the FC ecosystem has collaborated on, we're able to offer meaningful tools that see management, the ease management, um, simplified de uh, de deployment, 
ensure predictable performance, and also high levels of availability. Some features that come to mind include diagnostic port, which can be used to isolate issues at the electrical and optical level between two peer ports to ensure smooth error-free deployments, LCB or link cable beginning, uh, buffer-to-buffer credit recovery to ensure ongoing buffer-to-buffer -buffer credit recoveries if and when credits are lost over a period of time, FEC or forward error correction, um, TETA and DIFF, which adds extra guard tags for end-to-end -end data integrity. And most recently, we introduced VMID uh, that allows, uh, enables data center operators to gain more uh, insight and visibility into flows between the VM and their associated storage. And in my mind, the future of FC is, is bright. Uh, we've launched 32 gig uh, in 2016, and we're aggressively you know, investing in the future, uh, both in speeds as well as feeds. And we'll talk a little bit more about FC and VME, uh, which allows FC SANS to seamlessly carry FC PSCSI and native NVMe traffic without trip and replace. So AJ, though, um, according to the 451 survey of 100 enterprise customers, uh, there were some significant concerns that were brought up. AJ, can you actually walk us through what was discovered? Sure. I, I think it's important for people to think about the requirements for their data environment. Not all data environments are equal, right? Not all data sets have, have an equal importance to the, to the company uh, or to the business. So recovery point objective, or RPO, is a simple question to the business owner asking how much data can your business lose and you're still okay. And that answer may vary from application to application, right? They're not all the same. Recovery time objective, or RTO, is a similar simple question to the business owner of what is the cost opportunity of your business being offline or that application being offline? And that answer, too, may vary from application to application, but also by time of day, year, event, or season, right? Um, an example of that would be Black Friday, right? Nobody wants to, to have their transactional order entry systems or, or payment card systems offline on that day. That's totally true. I would be very upset if I couldn't get my order in on Black Friday, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know we all relate to that. So, so but Praveen, um, were there any other reasons for not transitioning to HCI? Sure, Michelle. I think uh, there are multiple reasons uh, cited in the report um, based on this 451 survey that came into play. But let me touch on a few of those that I thought were interesting and I was able to actually triangulate. So based on a Gartner report that I was reading the other day, um, today's HCI solutions are provider-specific and product-specific. HCI solutions don't interoperate, so there is a real threat of vendor lock-in. And although ease of management is sometimes cited as a feature of HCIS, in reality, the breadth of network layer configuration, change, and provisioning management within the HCIS appliances themselves can often be limited. Uh, this can compromise SLAs around QoS and traffic management, which Fiber Channel can uh, very easily take care of. And there are no standards that these vendors can claim, claim compliance to, and hence there's no industry standard benchmarks to compare one solution against another. So that's really the way I see it. So Praveen, though, but what is change in storage and how does this impact the network infrastructure? So Michelle, as we discussed in an earlier slide, uh, one of the key trends in storage is the emergence and rapid adoption of flash. As flash latencies go down, performance goes up, um, NVMe has been designed from the ground up. It's a new block storage protocol which allows faster access to these uh, faster media. NVMe is a block storage protocol like SCSI However, unlike SCSI, which has been around for over three decades and was built really for rotating media, um, NVMe is built for flash with a very efficient, highly streamlined command opcodes. And uh, it has deep parallelism with support for 64,000 queues and each queue going 64,000 IOs deep. So you have two choices. You can either uh, deploy NVMe within a server and then you're, uh, you're capped by the speed of the PCIe bus as well as by the limited slots that you can insert those PCI, uh, those devices in. But if you share storage over a SAN, 
uh, like FCN, VME, or, or other uh, Ethernet uh, transports, then you are able to grow independently both your storage and compute nodes. And you're really capped by the network transport at that point in time. AJ, what do you think? Yeah, I think I think that's true, Praveen. I, you know, flash storage is already putting high demands on the network infrastructure. We're seeing that, you know, day to day as people are, are moving into an all flash um, data center. But with NVMe, devices are coming in at a latency that's one fifth of the current NAND devices, or or even the cache in the front end of the arrays, and that stress is going to increase, right? And and that's also going to mean that you're going to have more need for diagnostics and measurement. Right? But also the rate of change in that, because for the first time, a variant of Moore's law is going to apply to storage, right? Um, the four to five year cycles that we used to see between disk drive speeds, you know, 5400 RPM to 7200 RPM and so on, those are gone, right? And now infrastructure is going to be able uh, to, or going to need to be able to meet that demand in that rate of change. But AJ, what begs to question is why fiber channel for NVMe? Well, so Michelle, I think that, that one of the biggest things is if, if you stop for just a second and you think back to how Flash succeeded in the, in the environment, right? So the, the SSD drives came in, and because they were built to the same form factor with the same serial attached SCSI connector, right? You could plug them into any RAID array, right? It was just a, a straight plug-in, which allowed for a very gradual shift in the environment. Right? People do not rip and replace. Um, in, in, in data centers, right? There's no magic six-month transformation in IT. You know, you'll find, um, you know, strange people that will talk that way, but nobody I know of that takes a trouble call at two in the morning ever says that, right? So I think that's going to be this, a, a very similar thing for NVMe over Fiber Channel because you can plug NVMe into your existing Fiber Channel SAN and run it concurrently with the SCSI platforms that you already use, right? Our, our friends from, from Cavium Q Logic have the ability to run concurrent drivers. So, you know, what, what's going to happen then in that, in that case is as customers discover which applications can best take advantage of the NVMe performance, right, you'll be able to seamlessly migrate those flows over to NVMe performance without disrupting, without ripping out, without having to go rebuild an entire network infrastructure because the existing Gen 5 and Gen 6 fiber channel SANs can already take that um, that traffic, right? And so without having to touch that infrastructure, that that makes it huge for that migration. Wouldn't you agree, Praveen? Absolutely, AJ. And uh, I think uh, I have some uh, uh, points I want to make too. But before I go there, let me just restate three important data points that I think we should all remember. Um, Flash is growing at about 26% CAGR year over year in the data center. So if I'm doing my math right, it's doubling every three years. And uh, fiber, all flash arrays, all flash is now really becoming all NVMe because that's the newest protocol that enables you to get access to these medias faster and in a more optimized way. And uh, uh, all flash arrays are attaching to fiber channel at over 80%. So that in itself gives, makes you, make, convinces you that flash is important, fiber channel is important. But here are some underlying supporting points. Fiber channel is lossless, not best effort. Fiber channel is a dedicated storage traffic network. It does not also do storage. NVMe is built from the ground up for flash. And, and so we think that FC is really the perfect transport for NVMe. And also, when we're talking about fabrics, like I mentioned earlier, fiber channel has been around for over two decades. It has built-in services like name server, zone server, and these are uh, key services that allow provisioning uh, hosts to discover their targets, to boot from SAN, as well as to enforce uh, policies of who can see what. These are mature services that are not available with other fabrics today. So we think FC and VME is really a, is, is the best marriage between a high-speed transport and high, me, high, high flash media. Um, also, I think, uh, like AJ said earlier, the hardware from the FC vendors today is, uh, is FC NVMe ready. You don't have to go and buy new hardware today. All you have to do is work with the vendors and uh, make sure that you have the right software components to be able to in seamlessly add FC NVMe traffic to your existing FC workloads. Michelle, back to you. So, Praveen, can you describe why Fiber Channel continues to stay relevant? 
Sure. I think I'm probably going to be repeating myself here, Michelle. But uh, like I said, um, and this is probably the last slide, so I'll try to summarize some of my uh, earlier points. So FC was built from the ground up as a lossless, uh, uh, and, 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 and I really want to emphasize the word lossless because there is the storage traffic is lossless. Zero copy, fully offloaded, highly scalable, and highly deterministic. Uh, uh, block storage protocol. And FC has successfully delivered on all of these design goals over the last two decades, and it continues to be the transport of choice for mission critical works. Billions of ports have been deployed, billions of dollars have been invested in this technology because it continues to deliver. And like I said, the future of FC is bright. We launched 32 gig uh, in early 16 and the ecosystem is aggressively investing in the future around higher speeds, 64 gig, as well as FC and VME, uh, which allows FC SANS to seamlessly transport FCP SCSI and native NVMe traffic without a rip and replace. Besides speeds and feeds, the ecosystem continues to invest in software features that simplify provisioning, ease management, ensure predictable performance, and guarantee high levels of availability. AJ, how would you like to summarize this? Yeah, so I think I think those are all uh, very valid points, Praveen. And you know, if we think back, you know, a few slides ago, we were talking about critical capabilities required for businesses, right? And you know, st something that you mentioned that I'm not sure folks actually have a have had a chance to sort of wrap their heads around yet is your support for VMID um, in the in the platforms. You know, the the trick to this is that that the application owners are the ones that we have to provide data back to. We have to provide the, the, the measurement capabilities back to to say that their application is running the way they want it to run. And in, in server virtualization, you know, things, things got a little, a little foggier right, mm -hmm. in the manageability space, right? And so now with your support for, for VMID, we actually have the ability to tag traffic through your adapters uh, across the network, not just to, say, ESX in, in VMware, not just to the host, but actually to the virtual machine, to the application. So for the first time in, say, 15 plus years, we've got that visibility back, right? Now, think about that for a second and take that a step forward to your discussion on NVMe and the lower latencies on NVMe, right? And that becomes even more critical, right? When, you're, when your delivery trucks are beginning to run at Ferrari speeds, you want even better, more discrete traffic management, not, not the same or less, right? That's, that's not going to work out well for people. Mm -hmm. And so I think those, those combinations in, in the environment that you're providing to, to, the, to the fabric are going to be very critical. And I think, you know, earlier I was asking you before the, before the webcast started, because um, uh, customers have asked, you know, you guys talk about running concurrent protocols on the same adapter, on the same yes. cable, and the yes. cost effectiveness of that, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so I'll ask you to just repeat for me the, the statement you made to me about is there a penalty um, around, around running both protocols concurrently? There is no penalty. And uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah, so to me, that you know, the, the ability to non-disruptively take that new technology in to provide the same services you were talking about from a manageability standpoint, so it's just zoning, it's just in, you know, in, in the Brocade uh, environment fabric vision uh, uh, as an example, but now with the new VMID, um, pieces pieces tied into it, and the name services pieces that you were talking about. All these things that are already there, already functional for the for the data center, right? Around around that manageability and security, right? And you know, we we are fortunate in that we are not the most hacked protocol on the planet, right? Which other people are. Um, so reliability of the environment, scalability of the environment, and performance, right? Those were reasons why shared services got built to begin with, right? And I think those still matter, wouldn't you agree? I agree with you. And just to reinforce, AJ, one of the points that we discussed, in FC and VME, NVME is just a, another level for ULP, like SCSI. So to the underlying transport, everything just remains the same. And that's why we're able to seamlessly add these workloads into existing FCB SCSI SAMs. And so, Michelle, I think those are those are characteristics that both Praveen and I would agree are, are reasons why Fiber Channel is going to continue to be relevant for a long, long time. That sounds good. So I want to thank you, um, AJ and Praveen, for being with us today. Um, for the full survey results, we encourage you to check out the 451 uh, research uh, survey report that we spoke about in this call. Uh, for your convenience, you can download it from the right sidebar on your screen.
So take a moment to do that if you like. Uh, if not, it's posted on both of our websites so you can grab it then as well. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. If you have any further questions or would like more information, you can reach us through Brocade's community page or Cavium's website listed here. Uh, please join us next time for our upcoming webinar as we discuss distance connectivity for disaster recovery. And lastly, I would like you to I would like to ask you to please take a moment to complete a short survey that will pop up on your screen after this call. So thank you again for your time today and have a great day.